Test, test. It's harder to preach, though, because I use my hands so much. So, Okay, we'll try this. Before we start the message, I did want to share. Andrew gave us some good announcements. Announcements are usually things that are coming. They're ahead. <clears throat> I'm going to look behind. Two things happened this weekend. First is the uh, Safe Haven Gala. This is a picture. It was such a beautiful evening, a lot of fun. Raised money for Safe Haven, a women's shelter, and we had, I want to say, at least 50 or more people attend this year than last year. Uh, last year, they raised $50,000, and they used most of that to um, fix the building that they've moved into just here in the last month, and uh, it's a great ministry. It had a good time. That's all the pastors that were there that evening. I just took a picture with the pastors. So, so thankful for our church's role in that. The founder of Safe Haven, who moved off island now, uh, she was here in the first service, and uh, so was Mona, who runs Safe Haven. So just thankful for that ministry. I wanted to point that out. And then, the, then if you saw the slide of the women's ministry, they got the brunch coming up. They finished their Bible study, and then to cap it off, they're going to have their brunch. Well, yesterday, the guys, the men, we finished our Bible study. Let me show you how we, we cap off the finish of our Bible study. This is what the guys did. You know, slight, slightly different than what, you know. So we, we had barbecue. Uh, I, I, I kind of summarize it this way for the men's ministry. Bible study. Uh, barbecue and bullets. You know, that was, that's that's how it ended. So next time around, we'll um, um, do this again. But uh, did a little promo for any of the men that weren't part of the men's Bible study. But we got to put that away. I know we got to move on to the message now. Uh, we're in the book of Romans. We've had a little bit of a break because we had Easter and then I was off island last week. But I'm glad to get back to the book of Romans. We're starting chapter four. I've titled the message today, Justified by faith alone. And the key verse out of the passage, verse 3, says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, we're going to talk a lot today about this word counted. It's like a judge bringing that gavel down, and it hits, and he makes a declaration. That's what this word, the, the word counted, and the word justified, they come out of legal and accounting terms, and I want us to learn something today about our salvation. It is by faith alone, and, and this word justified just as if uh, we had never sinned, the righteousness of Christ given to us, a perfect record that's given to us, so it's a declaration like that. But the thing I'm going to hone in on, it says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted. So there's a moment when the, when the gavel comes down, there's a moment. Just like uh, a long time ago, I went to Japan, visited some areas. This was back in the 90s. And we went down and saw, we went to Hiroshima, and I saw the museum where they have a museum there where the atomic bomb uh, was dropped. And the museum, there's a, there's a clock in this little tower on a building. When the bomb went off, it froze. The, the clock, everything is destroyed, but this one, for, I don't know how it survived, but it's, it, the, the, the hands were frozen at the moment that the bomb went off. And I, I looked it up. I was trying to remember. I think it was like 8.15 or 8.16 in the morning. And it's like it happened at that moment. The first atomic bomb dropped on somebody in a war happened in that moment. And so there's this thought that I want to give. That this is like a timeline that runs that there is a moment. And he's using the word counted where the righteousness of Christ is counted towards you, okay? And we're going to learn about when that happened for Abraham and then ask the question, well, what about us? When did it happen for you? And so let me just take a look at um, this passage. I'm going to put some questions up there to set the, the context for us. Exactly how are you saved? When is the perfect record counted to us? What does the faith have to be in? Did people put their faith in something else? Old Testament, New Testament? Is faith itself a work? Because the point that Paul's going to drive out here is that we are saved, justified by faith alone. And the way he's going to teach us, he's going to give us two examples. We're going to look at two examples from the Old Testament. And here's the first one. Abraham 
the father, Father Abraham, the founder, the patriarch of Israel. He is the first example that he's going to give us. And let's start in chapter 4, verse 1. He says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? So if you look at this verse, the words what then, he's asking a question. It's the same way I put some questions up there, right? Because people will ask me questions. I put some of them up there. What does faith have to be and when does it actually happen when, when righteousness is counted? Here's a question Paul puts out there. He poses, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? Now, see how I highlighted the word flesh? Because the question that Paul's asking is going to center on what he did with his life. Wasn't there something about the life of Abraham where what he was doing in the flesh was accounted, that righteousness was counted. God's watching him, and I see what Abraham's doing. That's a demonstration of faith. He does believe, and the righteousness is given to him. Isn't there something about his life where we could find that timeline of history where it happened? And so he asked the question, and what I, I put here as the first point is that Paul wants us to consider that life of Abraham, the life he lived. I mean, just think in your head, some of the aspects of Abraham's life that took faith, right? Move out of your homeland over here. Didn't know where he was going. You are going to have a son. Even when I'm old, put your son on the altar and sacrifice him. I mean, just there's three examples right there that took some faith. Which one was it? Which one did was it counted? Because the way he's going to describe this, there's a moment it was counted. Righteousness is given over. When was it? And he wants us to consider the life of Abraham. And he goes on to say in verse 2, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. Now Abraham's the example from the Old Testament that he would use. He's the father of the Israelites. He's, he's the father of faith, the first. And he's saying, look at his life. Let's consider his life because if there's something there, if he's justified by works, then you know what that means? He could stand before God and be proud about something. Remember when I put him on that altar, my son? I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know you had a ram over there. You know, there was, there was something else that was substitute for my son. I left my home. I mean, there's so many things he could put on the table and say, I'm, I'm proud that I, 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 ha I got the faith right in that moment. But he answers his own question, but not before God. <laughs> That's the answer. And the answer is no. He is not justified by works. There is nothing that he did that he could lay before God, standing before him to say, I mean, basically, I deserve, you owe me, do you owe me something because I got it right? I did something right. None of us could do that. He's answering his own question, not before God. And so I put here, he wants us to consider the life of Abraham, but also he wants to correct this misunderstanding of works. Works do not give us before God a better record for which he will provide righteousness. We can live that way. We can feel like right now I have a little bit a better position, more favorable position before God. I haven't, and then fill in the blank. Like if there's a sin you struggle with, and you know, you know what, I'm really going to conquer this thing, and then you feel, you go a whole month, and you don't do the sin, and it's like, I'm feeling good. You, our flesh tempts us that way, to think that way. I, 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 I'm a little bit better because I've been, i got a good track record right now. And through this, he wants to, this misunderstanding of works. Abraham is the example. And he's saying he cannot stand before God. He is not justified by any works in his life. And he picks back up and he says, I'll read again verse 2, If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. It was no work. This 
this verse, see it's in quotes, believe, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteous, that comes out of Genesis, Genesis chapter 15. And in that chapter, that's the moment. That is the moment where it's counted as righteousness to him based on what? Belief. For God to offer himself to you and in a moment to put belief in that. That's the one, one stepping forward in faith. But, but the interesting thing is, because and I like to use the stage as like the timeline, as you, you go into Abraham's life, and here it is. We don't know a lot about Abraham except a couple things happened before this moment where that verse is, he is uh, told to leave his land, and he says, okay, he leaves his land, leaves his home. I've got a place for you. Not sure where it is, hasn't seen it, but he's going to leave and travel. Then his uh, relative Lot gets captured, and so he goes and chases after the, the kings that stole him. There's a battle. He defeats them. He comes back. There's a priest, Melchizedek. He comes, they offer a sacrifice, and after that moment, that's where this verse is. Abraham believed God and was counted him as righteousness. He, he put belief in God here. And then there's so many, the rest of Abraham's life is this journey of faith. There were other times where he had to put faith in him. For example, I'm old now, and um, you said I'm going to have a kid. There's a moment of faith he's going to have to have there. But then when he has the kid, Isaac, now sacrifice him. That takes faith too. But mixed in with all that are these moments where he lacks faith. I mean, before he gets Isaac, his wife comes to him and says, we're old. I, I, I've stopped bearing. I, I can't. I'm not fruit, fruitful anymore. I can't have children. You're getting old. Take my maiden. Have a child with her so at least you have a descendant. We're going to force fulfill God's promise. Not a great moment of faith for Abraham. He could back up. One of my favorites is when he went to Egypt. He's traveling through Egypt. Yes, he had faith to leave his land, but as he's traveling, he travels through Egypt, and they come out to see him. The Pharaoh, the, 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 the most powerful man in that land, and he sees Abraham, and he sees his wife, and he says, she's hot. I like her. And he asks about her. He's got eyes for Abraham's wife. Abraham says, that's my sister, because he's afraid. He says, if I, if I say that's my wife, he's going to kill me and take her. So I'm going to save myself and just say, that's my sister. Well, that didn't work out well, because then he took the sister to, back to his palace. Now you've got a married guy outside the walls of the palace, in with the most powerful man in the country who's got eyes for your wife. That it, he, he lacked faith. And there's this timeline of, up and down faith in his life. But what I want, to, I want you to point out is that Paul is teaching us something here. He says, in this moment, this Genesis moment right here, it's counted to him as righteousness. Well, what does that mean? Well, I put here, Paul wants to credit belief for salvation. It's the belief Okay, the belief, and I put here misrepresentation of Mishnah. I just put that because I want to make sure I don't overlook that because one of the reasons Paul is saying what he's saying is that Jews held Abraham in such high regard. There was, there was teaching that he never broke the law, that he was perfect, that he, before the law was even given to, to Moses, he fulfilled the law. He kept the law. They, they held him in that high regard. So there's a way in which Paul's going to do two things here. First of all, even if he was, that's not how he was saved. It wasn't the not breaking of the law. It was the belief that he had in what God said to him. That's the first thing. And then, but the second thing is that uh, he's going to call him ungodly anyways. And that's going to be a uh, a sword through the heart of every Jew. But before I get there, i got to talk about this word credit or account. Account. Do you understand accounting? Belief here was counted or credited. Now, the word is logizomai. It means to credit something. 
uh, is to confer a status that was not there before. Now, before I became a Bible major, I started out a business major. As a freshman in college, they put me in senior level classes. I don't know why they did that. I think it was the Lord because uh, I didn't like it at all. And I remember going, I don't like these accounting classes. The only class I really like is my Bible class. And it was part of how God used me to drift over out of business and accounting to uh, become a pastor. But I remember sitting in these accounting classes, the worst time of the day. It was in, it was in a room that didn't have air conditioning. And uh, it was after lunch. And the teacher, I don't think he's alive anymore, So, I'm, but but he was older, and because uh, this is like early 90s. And it's like the, the guy from Ferris Bueller where he's like, Bueller, Bueller. That's how he talked, monotone the whole time. You take this number here, you move it over to that column here. Are you with me? Are you with me? I just remember doing this constantly, you know. It's like, but I did learn some things about accounting, right? You have accounts, and there's nothing there. And then you take something from over here and you put it there, and now that account has something. That's the kind of language Paul is using here. Now, working here at the church, they don't do a paycheck where I take it over to the bank and have to cash it. We have an automatic deposit. We have our staff meeting, and Melly will come in, and she's got all the timesheets. I go through them. I sign them. And then she works with a company, and then it's just credited to my account. And then I look there, it's there. What I get paid is there. Uh, if I looked and there was nothing there, I'd say, hey, wait a minute. And so this, this is the idea that Paul's working with to teach you something about righteousness that you get. To credit something is to confer a status that was not there before. And in verses 4 to 5, he says, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. When I look in that bank account and Melly's done that work and there it is, I don't say, what a gift. The church gave me a gift. No. I, I, got, I earned it. I, I worked. And he says, that's not a gift. That's what you're due. You're owed that. And to the one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies who? The ungodly. See that? He's talking about Abraham. If, his, if, if he's justified by works, it's not a gift. If he would had enough faith moments where God looked at his faith moments and said, we're going to give righteousness to him, it's not a gift. It's, it, it was due him. He could stand before God and have some measure of pride to say, you owe me, but it's a gift. And then he goes on to say, how do you get this gift? The one who does not work. That means he hasn't done it. He doesn't work, but trusts him who justifies. Who? The ungodly. That would have been a shot to the heart to the Jews. What? <clears throat> you can't talk about Abraham in that context. His faith is counted as righteousness. And so I asked the question this way, what's your credit score? How, how hopefully you're not relying on works, but you are trusting. There's a belief. There's a moment in your life where you put that trust in the work of Christ. Now, what's interesting is this. I think it's, this is amazing what Paul's going to show you right here. And I use a quote from Tim Keller. It says, God treated Abraham as though he was living a righteous life. Genesis 15, right here, counted to him as righteousness. What's in the column of Abraham? Sin. He lacks faith. Yeah, there's some faith in there too, but they mix together in such a way that you would have to, to judge him. He, he lies about his wife. He doesn't even trust that you're more powerful than Pharaoh. What's in his column? But at this moment, he puts belief. And God puts in his column righteousness. Not his own. It's Christ's righteousness, 
but it's there. It's credited to him. And then God looks at him. Now he's going to walk through life. All these scenarios I was giving you. The Pharaoh, uh, uh, Ishmael, born through another woman instead of trusting in God's plan. That's all sinful. But yet God's treating him as if he is righteous. I mean, I think it's three different times it says in Scripture. It refers to God and Abraham as friends. Abraham was the friend of God. He wasn't the, the rebel. God looked at him, and he saw him righteous. Um, Martin Luther said, at the same time, both righteous and sinful. At the same time. Now, you got to understand, you have to be perfect. Any sin within you, you are judged. You break any part of the law. God's Word says you've broken all the law because the, the response from God is the same. There isn't a response that is, well, you get, you get more punishment and, and, and you get less because the way you rebelled was different. No. All sin is dealt with. The wages of sin, that's what you earn, is death. Spiritual death, separation from God. And God yet can look at us both righteous, even though we are sinful. Another writer said, this crediting is to account him a righteousness that does not belong to him. And that's the righteousness of Christ. These words he's going to use, I'm going to talk a little bit more next week because the word credit, the word impute, it's used uh, many, many times. And it's to give over something to someone else. We give our sin over. It goes over in that ledger, that accounting terminology to Christ on the cross. And what is the result of that? Death. And he took death on the cross for us in our place. But then the other imputation is to give to us the righteousness of Christ. We're not left neutral. We are innocent. And I think I used the example weeks ago. It's not like a pardon. A pardon is I'm, I pardon you, you're out of jail. But you go into society and the record's still there. You were in jail. This is innocent, as if you never committed it. It's different. And so, what's your credit score, right? When did this happen? What did he believe? First of all, when did it happen? He's answered that. He's quoting from Genesis. He's saying it was at that moment, this Genesis moment, it was credited to him as righteousness. And going through his life, he is saved. He's saved because of that. He still has to grow and mature. There's going to be times where his faith wavers. We see that in his life. And yet, that is a description of us. There's a moment where we're saved, yet through life we have to grow and mature. I'm going to come back to that later, but I want to ask this question, what did he believe? What was it that he believed? Now, the interesting thing about this is you could maybe, I I bet you I could get multiple kinds of answers from you on that. Well, he had to believe that he would be the father of a nation, a, a lot of descendants. That's part of the promise, right? Or he had to believe that his son was going to sit on the throne. He had a king that was going to be an heir. I mean, what specifically is it? He had to believe, he had to have the faith that even though... I'm going to put Isaac on the altar. If I sacrifice him, somehow God's going to either bring him back to life or somehow God's going to provide another kid. I mean, there's many aspects you might say there. But I'm going to answer the question by going to the words of Christ. The words of Christ in John chapter um, 8. He says, Jesus says this. He says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. And there's something there that Christ is alluding to, which is this. That Abraham's belief wasn't in a generic fulfillment of, yes, from me, my, my progeny, my, my, the nation, there's going to be a blessing to all the world. No, Yes, but specifically, it would center on one, 
one descendant, and that was Christ. That God was going to fulfill what he was saying to him through one person. And Christ said he longed to see this day, and he saw it in me, in Christ, and he was glad. And there's a way in which the, to drive at the answer to this. What did he believe? And I say to you, when did this happen in your life? When were you credited with righteousness, not your own? And what did you believe? Because what you believe must center on Christ. What it is about Him, who He was, and what He did. It centers on that. Now, you said, Pastor, there's two examples. Yes, and most of the message has been the one. You're like, I hope the second example is shorter. It is. It's David. He's going to go on talk about David, the model king. He was a warrior. He was perhaps the most famous of the kings, a monarch. First example was Abraham, which in the context Paul's talking about, they held him up like he was not a lawbreaker. He, fu he, he fulfilled it before it was even given. David, they could never say that about David. They could never hold David up in the same way they could Abraham. We all know about David. David was a lawbreaker of the worst kind, right? And what's he say? Just as David, in verse 6, also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. That's why I highlighted works there. Because see, Abraham was to deal with the person who wants to emphasize the works. I could stand before God with some pride because I've done it. Abraham, no. Righteousness accounted apart from works. It was belief. But now David is the one who is like, we know it ain't works. It's not works. I mean, we know the life of David, right? I mean, David sees Bathsheba, lusts after her, develops a plan, seduces her, gets her pregnant. Uh-oh, that's adultery. Let me call your husband back. Go, I'm going to send him to your house. You know, drink wine. Get him into bed. Now he'll think the child, because Bathsheba came and said, hey, I'm pregnant. Now we'll think the child is not mine, it's your husband's. But that doesn't work. His, her husband is so faithful to David, he sleeps at his door. I won't go back to my wife. I can't. Faithful servant. So then he devises a plan to have him killed. Send, sends a letter. Put him at the front of the battle where the fighting is the worst. So we got rid of him. Whew. And nobody knows but me and Bathsheba. He was, a, he was not by works, David. So, why, and so, so there's a way in which, why is he using him in this example? And part of it has to do with this, is that in the Old Testament, when they came into that system of the temple and they went through the motions of sacrifice, there was not a sacrifice that could be made for premeditated sin in the way that David committed it. Is that, does that, I mean, that should raise your eyebrows. Well, I thought God will forgive anything, but there's something being communicated. And here with David, he couldn't, he, he had to be totally helpless before God. I can't even, I committed this sin. I can't even go to the temple to deal with it. They don't have something to deal with as bad as I've done. And he goes on to say in the verse, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. David, certainly righteousness is given to him, certainly not by works, but because he saw the true state that he was in. When he got convicted of what he did, he fell down before God. He knew only by God's grace. He was helpless before God. And you can see a contrast. I think one of the reasons that Paul uses both Abraham and David is there's a contrast. I put it up here, Abraham versus David. This is a quote from David Jeremiah. It says, Abraham's justification is presented in a positive way. He was credited with righteousness. David's justification is presented in a negative way. His sin was not credited against him. You see that? And so when we go back to those accounting terms, there's my column. My sin is not going to be credited. It's taken all the debt. Everything is taken out of that column. But the righteousness that comes in is Christ. And you see how God works 
through both these examples to teach us that in how we are saved. Now, those are the two examples. Now, what the, the next thing he's going to do when he's going to finish this out is give some further explanation for how we're saved to answer that question. And the first part, and I might ask the question, is how important is ceremony? There's a lot of things we do in church. Communion, baptism, uh, depending on what kind of church you go to, they might have more in there that you have to do. And I ask the question, how important is all that? How important is all that in connection to your salvation? That's how I should frame it. Because he's going he's gonna to pick up on this. And look what he says in verses 9 and 10. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. Now, I know I use the word circumcised and uncircumcised a lot there. So let me, let me, let me, um, first service I read that and like a lot of people glossed over it. Like that was too much circumcision. But let me explain it. And circumcision was the covenant sign. I put, I have a covenant with God. I have put my belief and faith in Him. Now, we're talking about when righteousness was credited to Abraham. He's asking the question. Essentially, he's asking, is it only for Jews? But before he gets to answering that, he's talking about the ceremonial part. Is the ceremonial part, how necessary was that for salvation? And his answer is going to be that Abraham was righteous long before he went through that ceremony. And if you go back to this moment, this is why it's important. That's why I started with the Hiroshima example. There's a moment that's like it's still on the clock. We know it happened right at this time. We know that righteousness was accounted right at this time in that Genesis 15, and he's going forward. Do you know it was 15, uh, 14 years between that moment he was counted righteousness before Abraham was circumcised? 14 years. Well, the Jews, if you're not circumcised, you are not part of God's family. You're not part of our nation. You're not part of our people if you are not circumcised. You have to be circumcised. And he's deconstructing that. There's a way in which you take that, and somehow it becomes part of the works. Your confidence is in that. Only a chapter or so ago, I was going to say weeks. I don't know how many weeks ago we preached on this. We talked about this where Paul was saying, look, you come in here, you do the ceremony part, then you walk out that back door and you live in a way in which you are not a saint. He says, you know what that does? It undoes your ceremony. He says, if you, if you say, I'm saved because I'm circumcised, and you go out that back door and you live like a sinner, it undoes that circumcision. He talked about that. He was saying, what really matters is the circumcision of the heart. What, what you are in here is a true testimony of your salvation. And Abraham was saved in this moment, and he walked forward in life, even though he hadn't gone through that ceremony part, he was still saved. The evidence of that would be his walk of faith. It's possible that you could say, I got circumcised here, but the way you walked in life was not, you weren't saved. You didn't follow. You didn't follow Christ. You didn't follow His Word. Maybe it was later on, but he's making this point about where, how the ceremony plays a role in here. So how important is ceremony? Abraham was justified long before circumcision. And you might think about how this applies to us today, because that's Old Testament, right? Baptism. Some people say if you're not baptized, you're not saved. But this fits that. I've talked with people like, okay, you do need to get baptized because that's obedience, obedience. But it's possible that you put your faith in Christ and got saved and said, we're going to get, we're going to do a baptism on Sunday. Woo so the whole church can celebrate. And then you die in a car accident. Oh, uh-oh, I didn't get baptized. Bab baptism confirms something that is in here the faith that's in here, it does not confer to you salvation in and of itself. It confirms. And now that would be a problem if you say, well, I'm not going to do that. Well, why would you not do that? But that's basically everything in life. God says, I want you to do this. And there are a great many number of things in our life that we say, well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> 
That is the journey of faith, yielding more and more of ourself to Christ and being obedient to Him. So, I want to sprinkle this in right here, because we live in a we live in a um, culture here in Guam that's uh, uh, highly Catholic, a lot of Catholics, and sometimes I have this conversation with him because. When I, my observation from the outside looking in is there's a lot of ceremony. There's a lot of ceremony, a lot of things you have to go through and a lot of things you have to do. And there's a way in which I think that teaches something that's not theologically correct. It doesn't line up. What, what he is saying here is what matters is when was that moment? That moment when you put your faith, that belief, that's what he's saying about Abraham. Not works. Not even a ceremony. He went 14 years without the ceremony, but he was righteous. God looked at him as if he was righteous, even though there's sin in his life. But he was covered, covered with the righteousness of Christ. And that's what I would shepherd people towards. When is that moment? You need to have faith in that. I think there's be some people who come out of churches that those churches have sometimes shaped within him, I'm okay because I did a lot of ceremony in my life. In fact, there's some churches that say even after you die, your relatives can get together and have ceremonies and it's going to help you. That's a lie. Do not put faith in that. Salvation is by faith alone in the work of Christ and nothing else. So my second point is to say salvation is by faith alone in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament because he's teaching you something else here too. Let me show you what it says. It says he received a sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised. And he goes on to say, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. He's talking about non-Jews, people who are not part of your Judaism, people who didn't get circumcised. He's saying he is the father of them. Why? Because of faith. He is the father of faith first and foremost. And when we follow in the footsteps of faith, Abraham was our representative too. And he goes on to say, to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. The reason why God did it that way, the reason why he came to him and it was in this moment, righteousness is credited to you. And now you didn't get circumcised to hear was to say that in this period, I'm teaching something. And what I'm teaching is that it, that it isn't about the circumcision. It's about the faith. And that means because the Jews would say he was circumcised. That's a sign, the covenant sign. So everybody else must be that. If you're not that, he's not your father. He's saying it's about faith. And if you've put your faith in Christ, he is also Father Abraham to you. And that's why I say, because people will ask me, well, we're saved by believing in what Christ did on that cross and the resurrection. Well, what about the Old Testament? Jesus hadn't even come yet. So how were they saved? And the answer is right here. The answer is we are saved by looking back and putting our faith in Christ in the Old Testament, they are saved by looking forward and believing that Christ was going to come and do what He did. Does that make sense? It's the same salvation. It's putting our faith in trusting in Christ, in the words of Father, our Father, Heavenly Father. And the very last point I put here is that salvation is everyone, because there's a way in what He's driving at here is it's not just Jews. He's trying to deconstruct that. And so we get these two great explanations about when righteousness is credited to us and then, uh, or examples, I should say, and then he kind of unpacks it a little more to help us understand. These explanations are good. You know, I look through this and I think there's a lot of detail. Sometimes uh, it's, it can be hard to unpack it all, but I'm just going to finish with this. I keep coming over here because this is where I said, you know, Genesis at one point where where righteousness was credited to him. As he goes forward the rest of his life, God sees him as righteous. Even though he's, he's sinful, it's both. And his faith wavers sometimes, as I've given you examples of that. 
but it's a journey of faith. And so the, the way that I will finish the message today is to, to kind of have an exhortation to you. There should be a point in time. This, is, this was the time for him. I started with the, the uh, illustration of Hiroshima because there was an exact point in time where the bomb was dropped, it went off, and it was still on the clock. What, what time was it for you? You should be able to look back. When was there a time where righteousness was counted? See, I was saved when I was five. I remember my father. I can remember it, him coming in. And I was young. I did not understand everything, but I understand. I understood the gospel message he was explaining to me, and it's in, in just basic. But there was a lot of, I couldn't explain to you about the Bible for sure. Now, I move forward in my life, and I still have to learn a lot about what it means to, to walk right. Because, you know, growing up with brothers, there's lots of honoriness in our house. We're being taught righteousness, even though I'm being taught righteousness and there's definitely periods of unrighteousness. God's looking at me. How? He's looking at me as if I am righteous. But I was baptized middle school, sixth grade. Look at that. Five years old to sixth grade, but I'm still saved. The baptism at this moment didn't mean I'm saved from that point, And so I was unsaved here. No, I, was, I still had the faith. It's just like Abraham. His was 14 years. But when I got old enough to affirm, because we call it believer's baptism, when you're a, we don't um, teach uh, infant baptism because an infant cannot put a profession of faith in the gospel message of Christ. But at some point, I affirm that with the baptism. And this is my whole life. It's similar to Abraham. Except I've only had one wife. Kids through one wife. You know, there's that big difference. You know, I thought we you would laugh more at that, but okay. But the reality is, this is you. When was that moment for you? When was righteousness credited to you? That's the the question to answer. And then you say, well, Pastor, it says Abraham believed. How do we do that? And Paul answers that in Romans. He says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and you say it with your mouth, Paul says these words, you will be saved. It's its most simplest form. I did it when I was five. Didn't know everything but growing up in faith, trying to follow after Christ. I still am doing that. So that would be the way I would take this at the end and for you to kind of apply it to yourself. Remember, God sees us as righteous. If you, if you walk in a way that you're wrestling with guilt all the time or you're feeling proud because you haven't done bad things, you don't get it. God sees us with the righteousness of His Son. Praise the Lord for that. Father, thank you so much for Paul's letter, and it's got a lot of depth to it, but to be able to get the main points out and apply it to us, we see here that the examples of Abraham and David teach us something. They teach us about there is a moment where we are saved, that legal declaration where there is a credit that's given to us, something that wasn't ours, it wasn't in our column, and you give us that righteousness, you take out of our column the, the sins of our life, and you put it into the column of Christ on that cross. And we're just so thankful for the way of salvation. I pray that, that we would have a contemplation, a um, conversation perhaps, even here in our church, in our smaller groups, about when was that moment? When were we saved? When did you put faith in Christ? If you've never been baptized, then to talk about that, that there has to come a moment where we do publicly tell people that we are saved. Paul said, if you believe in your heart and say it with our mouth, that there is a public aspect that we, we declare that we do put our faith, our belief in Christ. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your patience. We lift this up in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and we'll finish as we worship together.